The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us and great to have my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. We have a great discussion ahead. Elliot, over to you to kick us off. Great. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Um, I think we have a pretty interesting topic lined up today. And I'm going to start by trying to paint a visual for you all because it's based on a chart that I was exposed to recently. It's a chart that JP Morgan put out in their uh, annual chart review from the asset management side. And what it shows is a graph of the 2000 to 2005 period, unprofitable tech, profitable tech, and the indices. And profitable tech, well, let's start with in 2000, it starts with like the frenzy upward. So it's indexed to 100. Unprofitable tech goes from like 100 to 70, so up 70% in short order. Unprofitable uh, profitable tech goes up by 50%, so a little less than uh, the unprofitable brethren. But then by the end of 2002, you have profitable tech down 50% uh, from the baseline starting point. So not from its peak, from the starting point. So it's down more than 50% peak to trough. And you have unprofitable tech down 80% from the starting point. So from its peak down well more than 80%. Um, and we'll share the chart with you so you could get an image of it. But then what happens from that point is that uh, there's a bifurcation. So the chart breaks down unprofitable that becomes profitable from the unprofitable that stays that way through it all. And the unprofitable that becomes profitable basically gets uh, all the way back to the starting point and beyond, not to the frenzy level highs, but and beyond um, by 2004. And profitable also gets back to similar levels. And interestingly, by the end of the period, the unprofitable companies who had become profitable performed very similarly to those that stayed profitable throughout. I hope that explanation could add some visual to what we're going to talk about. But I think it's really interesting and sets a very useful analogy for thinking through where we are and what happens next from here. And interestingly enough, if you were to cut off this chart at like 2002-ish, it, it looks a lot like ARC right now. So maybe here's here's some things to think about. We went through a similar period where there are a lot of unprofitable companies. So in 2020, the percent of the Russell 2000 that was unprofitable peaked at 47%. Now, let's be clear, this was not all just about growth and growth at all costs, because in fact, the percent of unprofitable companies in the Russell 1000 growth was actually less than the Russell 2000. Part of this was the pandemic effect. But over the long run, about 20% of Russell 2000 companies had been unprofitable. And yet we're still at about a third of the companies in the Russell 2000 being unprofitable. And we've been at about that level since the end of 2021. So, you know, we had Mario Sabelli on the podcast uh, about uh, six months ago. And I think it was really interesting. Mario talked about how there's a new reality for public small and mid cap companies. And a few things that we should keep in mind right now is that this correction was very swift. There were a lot of companies that didn't really have time to grasp these new realities, but the realities are new. We went from an environment that rewarded growth at all costs, one that ignored profits, to one that I think now you know everyone could agree that investors want to see profitability. 
And, you know, much like in the 2000 period, the the image that I just tried to draw for you, even profitable companies were not immune. And I think this is both because you had a lot of investor contagion and cross ownership between uh, the unprofitable and profitable companies, but also because many of the profitable companies had rapid growth and they saw the rewards in the market of growth. And there was this feedback loop between, oh, the more we grow, the better our stock is. So let's shift our focus toward more growth rather than delivering margin. And so, you know, you eventually stop having that growth while you're still investing for it. And new reality sets in in Mr. Market, uh, in the marketplace. And, you know, I think we're starting to see inklings of change. One anecdote that I'd share from this week's earnings calls is Danaher was asked about the MA landscape. And they said, we are starting to see would-be sellers show recognition, recognition in quotes, of change and in quotes, acceptance of lower valuation levels. So, you know, that's one way you start seeing companies acknowledge that, yes, we are in for new reality. So I'd argue that we're somewhere in the mid to late 2002 period um, where there was maybe another like push down, but also where things started to round out and you started to see even in the unprofitable companies, some improved performance. So those companies recouped far less of what they'd lost than those companies that eventually became profitable. Um, if this is the case, I'd argue it's time to really be looking at these companies and to start thinking about, can I identify any companies out there that today are unprofitable, but in the near future will be profitable and not just profitable, but very much so. Um, well, over the last two years, you absolutely would have lost a lot of money investing in even profitable tech companies because like in 2000, some of those were down 50%. You know, you end up with something like Google down 40% last year, or sorry, Alphabet. Um, this is, I think, the most fertile hunting grounds in the market today. Um, but by far the most upside is going to come from those companies that are unprofitable right now that will become profitable. So what are some signs to look for that changes afoot, that some of these companies might become profitable that aren't just yet? I'd say some of the things that come to mind for me are look for companies that are doing cost cuts. Look for an activist presence where there's a roadmap put out by investors for change. Look for management change where the CEO or founder has retired or stepped down and is replaced by someone who's got a new focus. And oftentimes you can track down the history of that person. And typically there'll be someone who has brought about some kind of positive uh, evolution on the earnings power or profitability of a company. Look for divestitures alongside any focus on core and cancellation of projects that were adjacent to where the primary business of the company had been historically. Look for midterm profit targets when it's a company who'd never spoken about such things in the past. Um, this creates something they can be held accountable to. Do some non gap style sleuthing and hunt the proxy for management comp changes. These could include anything from large grants, which would incentivize getting things right in a new environment, to outright incentives that are tied to profitability when they formerly hadn't been in a very stru very structured way. Now, beyond that, you also need to believe that profitability is achievable. So any company could put these things out there or these signs could be there, but underlying it all, you want to look for good unit economics. One of the things I'd want to look for are very high gross margins. If you have really high gross margins and you're breaking even, odds are there's some bloat in your organization somewhere there. Um, look for, you know, specifically in bloat, high R&D in a business that shouldn't necessarily need it. Um, so, you know, I want to throw this out to John and Phil and ask you guys the question, you know, where on this chart do you think we are today? Is it even a good roadmap for thinking this through? Maybe I'm crazy. And also, what are some signs you'd look for that a company is changing its focus from not delivering on profitability to doing so today? I think it's a great question, a great topic. I don't know where I would say exactly we are, but I would say the analogies you made are pretty apt. I would say we're probably somewhere in that transition period. Like, I don't know. If you're if you're using the 2000 to 2004 thing, which you, which we'll put in the the show notes, you know, somewhere towards the middle, 
to maybe 60th, 70th percentile. I don't know. I mean, look, the pain last year in these unprofitable companies was severe. In a lot of cases, the equity market caps were down 60, 70, 80%. We can all point to several that were down 90 or even 97, 98%, which is really hard to do. Like it's pretty stunning to see a company go from you know, a meaningful market cap to something down 97 or 98% without having filed bankruptcy. And to, to the best of my knowledge, none of these companies really did file bankruptcy last year. Uh, whereas I could point to, you know, several dozen like prominent examples that were down 90, 95, 98%. So it's pretty stunning. So you have to say we're like well into the game here if if, if the analogy holds. Um but yeah, I think the, the best questions we should be asking are, are what you just said, Ellie, which is like, which one of these companies is going to actually make that transi- transition? And again, it seems like every one of these debates and arguments keeps coming back to Amazon. And we had a, a lively debate some weeks ago about the quote unquote showing a little leg moment. And and your contention, Ellie, was that like a lot of these companies need to at least do that now. And you know, I have mixed feelings on that as I expressed then, but I think the point remains that like, if there are companies out there that either weren't optimizing for any sort of profitability before, and they're going to now, and their stock's down 70, 80, 90%, that's a pretty fertile hunting ground. Like that, there are going to be some big winners in there. So we should be looking for some of those. The problem is, I, I should, I tried, I couldn't find it. Somebody put out a really interesting number that I think I read on Twitter, but I can't remember. But it was a basically kind of an an off-the-cuff study of like, name me a company that was like run, not loosey-goosey, but clearly run during an era of like ample VC funding, didn't care about profitability. It was clearly just trying to go. And then they flipped the switch, right? And went back and cut costs. And then all of a sudden they're like super profitable or even just profitable at all. And there were they, uh, the author or the person making this comment couldn't really find any or any meaningful ones. There were like a couple maybe, but they were tenuous at best. And I think that's really true. I think, you know, we all know people, we all know businesses that are like that, right? I mean, you get stuck into a certain way of doing things, a certain lifestyle, so to speak. And it's really hard to just flip the switch and say, all of a sudden we care about costs and we care about this and we care about you know, all the stuff we used to do before, that's all out the window. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys saw this, but uh, just yesterday, we're recording this on January 26th, 2023. And, and just yesterday, I saw this article that in all these layoffs that are, you know, making such news around the world right now, but that are focused mostly in the tech sector, which is really kind of bizarre, right? Because it's like, you know, the headline will be something like Microsoft lays off X thousand people today. And it's like, well, that is a percentage of all the new hires they made last year is like, you know, 15% or something. It's some ridiculously small number. But anyway, in the headline yesterday, it was, um, I saw it on a, I think it was a CNBC article that somebody sent me that um, among the several thousand people laid off in Google's California offices, 27 of the people were full-time onsite massage therapists. (laughs) Yes, I saw that too. And it's like, you know, that's, that's fine, I guess, for Google because... You know, Alphabet's a giant diversified company and they have all the money they'll ever need for, you know, several centuries. And it would be hard to like really put the company on the straight, uh, you know, on the on a straight path to ruin and decline in any sort of hurry. But it's like, do we really need any on-site massage therapist? Hey, Phil, if you 20? cut your head count 10%, you cut 10% of your masseuses, right? <laughs> well, so you could back that, into how many they had before, maybe? That's what I mean. Like, it does beg the question, like, my God, like, how many masseuses were there and, like, what else is going on? And, like, we all know, like, all of these companies, you know, particularly tech companies, but any company that's big and successful is going to have, like, you know, some some bureaucracy, some fat, some excess built in there. Like, I totally get it. It's really hard to maintain that sort of like frugal discipline of a startup over, you know, many years and, and a lot of success. But look, I will point to, you know, one of my all-time favorites, like Costco doesn't really have any of that. It's been remarkable that they've sustained that for so long. On the flip side, you know, the whole like, oh, we're not going to spend money thing can really cut both ways, as we just saw with Southwest, where they kind of stubbornly have refused over the years to spend money and reinvest in things that turned out to be pretty important. So I'm not saying there's like just a one size fits all here. But anyway, my my broader point, I got off on a bit of a digression there was I think it's really hard to switch from being 
unprofitable. We only care about these adjusted metrics. We only care about unit economics that in a lot of cases are a little bit dubious in terms of how they're calculated. And to just completely reinvent your margin structure. I mean, to your point, Elliot, a lot of these unprofitable tech companies that we're talking about, like, I don't know if you were to comprise an index of today's unprofitable companies, tech companies in particular would have really high gross margins, like you said. And it's like, where is all this money going? Right? It, it, it is kind of stunning. And I get it. A lot of it is reinvested in future growth. And I actually will circle back in a few minutes and talk about the accounting around that because I find that debate to be really interesting. But uh, it, it is it is tough. And so if anybody has good examples of companies where they have a lot of conviction around uh, you know, going from unprofitable to profitable, I am all ears. But I'll, I'll stop there and then I'll circle back on the incentives and the accounting in a minute. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, I really have a recipe for identifying those kinds of companies. Um, what I would look for or usually require is just a company that's unprofitable today, that's taken a beating, that there's an either an owner-operator at the helm where you know that person is really going to do whatever it takes to right the ship, if that's possible. Or that there's, you know, basically large insider ownership because you want to know that somebody truly cares, and this isn't going to be a case where the consultants come in and uh, make some recommendations about what can be cut and 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 how the strategy can be changed, um, you know, and the management is already thinking about their next gig. Um, so I think that's super important. I remember back in the day, there was a company called Lending Tree, um, still exists. I think it's just Tree today, but basically it took a huge beating in that first dot com crash. And, uh, or actually, was it 2008? Um, it was dot com and, and IAC cleaned them up. It, well, no, Lending Tree is. To it, I think it's it, well. It does have a its own stock ticker. You might yeah be yeah thinking, they they then okay. spun them off. Oh, in, oh wait, got it. they spun them off during uh, dot com uh, okay. during a uh, financial crisis. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember it took a huge beating. It was basically trading for less than net cash, I think, and um, it did have an owner operator who I think is still at the helm. And it staged a huge comeback um, as a company and as a stock. And, you know, looking today, there are quite a few companies that are unprofitable, that do have an owner-operator or a very highly interested uh, management team. And those are the ones I'd look at first uh, to try to identify potential uh, opportunities. Yeah, those are good points. You know, it is really hard. If you look at the list of um, high flyers during dot com, most of them absolutely flamed out. Um, I'd say to counter the point about how hard it is, there are two, I'd say, considerable differences today versus in that epic. First off, a lot more of these companies do actually have a decent revenue base. So a lot of the dot com companies never really got to any any kind of product market fit and they were really just experiments and ideas that had come public. Um that's not exactly the case with this crop of unprofitable high flyers. They were more trying to be uh well and let let's be clear here. There were some pretenders. There are some pretenders. There are some really junky companies out there, but there are also a bunch who are like, I'm the next Amazon and I think I have a very long growth runway and I'm going to invest in it because I could capture it. Uh, but still while having like good underlying unit economics. Um, and then, so that's one big difference. The other is that there, there is kind of because of what happened with .com, a roadmap of what does and doesn't work and what companies do and don't need to do. And I think a more knowledgeable base of investors who could help lead some of these companies um, to maybe we'll call it the promised land <laughs> and get back to profitability. Um, Phil, I'm glad you brought back my quote about uh, that, that I borrowed from Modest Proposal or that, that I cited to Modest about showing a little leg 
of profitability. I think this even gets above and beyond that because some of these companies just need to like reorient their North Star and have to go beyond. Like it's too late. Had they shown a little leg um, sooner, it would have been helpful. But there are some that absolutely just need to say, hey, we are going to deliver uh, profits to our shareholders. And they very much have the capacity to do so, but hadn't by choice. I get it that it's really hard to reorient, but there's nothing like getting smashed in the teeth and seeing your own equity value you get destroyed uh, to to inspire a catalyst. But that's part of why I think John appropriately said you need the right incentive structure, so owner operator, like someone who's got a lot of skin in the game, would be more likely to change. But also, that's part of why I'd say you know one of the foremost things to look for are either activist pressure or outright new management because you need a new set of eyes to make those kinds of hard choices. You also need to get buy-in from the employees that'll stay around. I really liked uh, Mark Randolph's story. He was Reed Hastings' oft-forgotten co-founder of Netflix about how lucky they got when they were on the brink of IPOing when dot-com really blew up and their IPO had to be canceled. And they were going to run out of money because they were geared to be one of these high flyers. And by that, I mean, they were not going to be profitable. They were going to be growing aggressively and they had much more staff than they needed for their revenue base. And because of that, they were like, well, what do we do? We don't have an IPO. We're pulling that. We don't have any more chance for VC. We got to cut our way to surviving. And they had to retrench and change their entire uh, strategy. And they had to lay off a lot of people um, and they had to do so in a way that was like really contra the culture they'd built and say, we're going to go out there and we're going to become profitable and then we'll revisit an IPO. So I think that's a great example of one where, you know, it's the very, very much the same forces, but it happened in the pre uh, public days. Uh, but also, one of the ultimate examples publicly, I think, is Priceline, uh, now booking.com. And what's beautiful about that story is they've I think, grown with a culture of frugality, much like Costco, based not far from me in Norwalk, Connecticut, no frills, none of the other dot-com bells and whistles. And um, I think if you'd seen their, if you if you saw their headquarters, you'd realize right away, they certainly don't have uh, any number of masseuses sitting there. Um, so I think, I think that's another really, really good example there. Yeah, I, that's an interesting one. I didn't think about Netflix pulling off that, change. I think that's a great example. And so again, I don't want to discount the possibility that it it certainly does happen. I think we could all probably agree though that Netflix is a uniquely well-run organization. Like every time I come across something they're doing, it's at the very high end of thoughtful, intelligent business management. And unfortunately the same is just not true of a lot of other companies, right? If it was, it wouldn't be so rare. It'd be, you know, business is hard. So I think that's meant to you know, praise Netflix for doing so well and for being so well managed and to just highlight the fact that not everybody is going to be Netflix or Amazon and it's just going to be hard. But again, like if there's a a Reed Hastings out there today who's just seen his stock get completely wiped out last year and it's down 80 or 90 percent or whatever, and now they're engaging in that hard bloodletting to make sure that the the business survives, then yeah, I mean, it's fantastic because even if they don't recover their prior highs, which would be my contention for at least many, many years, you know, it could very easily double, triple, quadruple on the way back up, you know, over the next few years, if the, if the cost cutting works, if the margin reset works, if the culture isn't completely eviscerated, if they're able to actually pivot. So, you know, again, I, I just liken it back to, we've all seen this on a more visceral level in our personal lives, right? Where somebody we know has like a good, you know, run in his or her career, you know, make some some big, easy, early money and it all goes right into fancy clothes, fancy cars, fancy houses. And then, you know, the luck inevitably turns for a period of time and it's really brutal. Like it is painful to go backwards. You know, I always think about, you know, the kind of one of the famous tenets of behavioral psychology, which I was first exposed to in Charlie Munger's uh, psychology of human misjudgment, the famous speech that he gave, you know, whatever it was almost 30 years ago now, I guess. And, uh, you know, people just go really crazy about minor decrements down. So when things change for the worse, they lose their minds. And, you know, it, it, it's it's analogous to loss aversion, right? Like the pain of loss is two, three, four times 
worse than the joy of gain is good. And so when people lose their on-site masseuse, when they lose their country club perk, when they lose their first class business travel, whatever the case may be, like that just tends to have some really crazy outlying negative responses to the downside. And so it's really hard to manage that, right? I mean, it's really tough for the CEO and everyone on down to deal with that fallout. So true that it's really interesting that you mentioned Netflix too, because um, this morning, uh, Stratichery had a, a, sorry if I butcher that pronunciation, an interview with uh, Michael Nathanson. And they talked about how unique Netflix is as an organization and marveled at their ability to adapt to getting punched in the face this year and so quickly um, change things that they'd said were sacred cows they wouldn't do, like advertising and come out with a product before the year ended when that wasn't even on the roadmap at the time they delivered earnings in January. So, uh, you know, I absolutely hear you. And I think that's why um, it's a combination of things. You know, the reward is going to be that much better for those who find the right ones, but the right ones are, you know, let's put it this way. You're going to be going for slugging percentage far more than just batting average in something like these. And it's perhaps why, if you take a portfolio manager's perspective, maybe one of the best ways to approach this all is look for a number of securities where there's a confluence of these things you'd look for in the potential to go right and build a basket of it. Don't make any one or two an outsized bet. Or alternatively, if you're big enough, become an activist and be the source of change. Get to know management and from the inside kind of spearhead uh, the push to what you'd view as a better uh, path. I do think there are some companies um, who are more open than in the past to hearing perspective from investors, how people are thinking about them, what people see as wrong, what people um, question about the company and how they could address those situations head on. And I feel personally, some of the companies that are most responsive to these kinds of um, conversations will probably be, listen, investors are investors. They're not operators. I'm not saying that any of us know better how to operate a business than anyone else. But I do think the companies that listen and synthesize that into their own thinking about what's right and what's wrong, like they'll come out way ahead. Um, so so I would I would view it from that perspective. And this chart is very much a basket. So you'd imagine this chart that that we kicked off the conversation with, this visual I tried to paint. Um, even in the uh, unprofitable that became profitable, I'd imagine you start seeing... It. I don't have a sense of the dispersion, but I'd imagine the dispersion is pretty damn wide. And there are probably a few phenomenally successful companies that drove a lot more of the returns in there than some of the companies that were just um, merely good. So that's part of why I do think it's it's one of those environments. And we talked about in the podcast with, with Mario Sabelli, but it might be a time where let's say you ran a concentrated book of like 10 to 12 names. You might consider going to 20 to 30 and having more bets out there. And you could stand to benefit in more than one way because the first benefit would be, you know, you capture the wave of this improvement and you could paper over some of the mistakes along the way. But secondarily, if it is a ripe environment for m a and some of these companies become more willing to sell now that they've grasped these new realities, as Danaher acknowledged about their uh, target landscape, um, you could get the opportunity to recycle capital at a much quicker velocity, which also can compound into pretty nice returns. So, you know, I think that that the concerns about why it may or may not be appropriate might have a second dimension to how to how to target it right now. I missed it. What did, did Danaher say something recently along those lines? Oh, yeah, that was the quote I put out there. Uh, what Danaher said was, um, would-be sellers are now showing recognition of change and acceptance oh. of lower valuation levels. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that that was where that came from. Okay. Yeah, you know, I've been following the uh, life science and biotech space in particular on this front. And for many months, the 
talk was that there's this major gap, that the reset was too swift, that the companies who are would-be sellers want to wait for a bounce, and only then will they consider selling. And you know, into the fall and the turn of the year, I've definitely heard a lot more like, okay, this has been a reset that's lasted too long. And let's keep in mind, let's put some dimensions to it. The biotech and life science reset started several months before the reset in unprofitable tech. So they're probably a little bit ahead of where some of these other companies are. But uh, you're now hearing distinct signs of everyone accepting that, yeah, this this is where we are today. Like, this is the environment today, and we can't fight it anymore. That there's not going to be this quick bounce back to how things were in 2020. And right, we're two years removed from what I'd call the peak. As far as I'm concerned, the peak was like early February of 2021. Uh, that's where you could look at ARC's chart and see when it peaked out. Um, so two years is a long time. Um, it's it's almost a lifetime. And as far as some of these companies are concerned, you have to, you have no choice. You have to accept these realities, yeah. uh, especially if you're unprofitable and cash burning. I mean, that's worse than merely being unprofitable. Well, I... I... It is worse for sure, and I, I came across unfortunately a company that uh, a, a close member of my family worked for that was actually a pre-revenue company that was dual listed in Europe and the U.S. and didn't raise money <laughs> during during pre-revenue. That sounds like yeah. two decades ago. <laughs> I didn't yeah, realize those yeah. were out there now. No, I, well, I mean, yeah, it's obviously in the medical field as you would as you would guess, but like I just can't. Fathom, and so this family member no longer works there. Uh, saw the writing on the wall and and left last year, and is is obviously going to land somewhere much better soon. So that's the good news. But it's like I just can't fathom what these companies were thinking when you know the, the salad days are obviously here. You know, we went from the dark depths of COVID and thinking like it was the end of the world, and rightly so. To then the capital markets are just wide open, like the floodgates were open like they have rarely been in history before in 2020 and 2021. You have literally bankrupt companies talking about raising equity and how you could sit there as a CFO and not take advantage of that funding to then wake up, you know, just a matter of a few quarters later in 2022 and be like, oops, we're almost out of money. Like it's just fascinating that that is even on the realm of <laughs> of the possible. But um while I'm at it, I just want to circle back. So you asked earlier kind of like do some non-gap style analysis of of the proxy statement and and is for some clues as to what matters here and I totally agree and so I mean I to me the the bigger story of how this all came to be and how this how we got here was that this all just boils down to incentives like so much else that could be said about business and finance and investing it it really does all come down to the incentives and in this case you know, coming out of the global financial crisis, you know, call it 2009, 2010, an extended period of very low growth, very, very low interest rates, free money kind of sloshing around everywhere. It put a huge premium on companies that could grow and the narrative of these massive tech companies, which were awesome companies. And we already talked about several of them, right? Google, Amazon, et cetera. You know, they were, they are and were fantastic companies and they grew like crazy and they disrupted the whole world. And so it put this massive pressure on CEOs and boards to say, we could do this too, and we can grow and we can be disruptive and we can be just like Jeff Bezos and Amazon or whatever. And that's what we got, right? We got companies that that did not incentivize profitability. In fact, it was like a bad thing to be profitable for quite a while. And the only thing that mattered was, you know, how much can you grow and and what is the TAM and what is the future addressable market and how big can we get and what sort of adjacent markets can we tap? And and that was that was really it. And I do think I I hesitate to say that it's over because you would have thought it was over a long time ago or would have been over by now. Maybe this time it really is over. Who knows? I, I put the nail in. It's over. You think it's over? Yeah. I look. I, that's the I way I would lean, but I wouldn't bet my life on it, right? I mean, I, you know. I mean, I, it doesn't mean there won't be some companies that hang on to yesterday, but I think it's it's categorically over. And I think that's part of why that uh, visual I painted the companies who clung to their no profitability. They just got no investor interest. People left them languishing. And, mm. you know, there will be some companies 
that stay that way by choice. And there will be some companies that stay that way because they were always meant to be that way. In other words, they didn't have a good business. Right. Um, but the ones that do that by choice, they'll languish and they'll be left in the dust. And I think the ones who grasp the realities earliest and quickest and grab the bull by the horns and make these tough but necessary changes, um, they're going to be the ones that bounce back the fastest and are in the best position to lead from here on out. Yeah, no, I totally, totally agree with all that. I, that's that seems exactly right. And look, I, I, I just, I, I would have thought we'd put a nail in this, you know, last year, twenty twenty two for sure. But and it does seem like there. I look, I will say there are some companies that are still clinging to the prior era, right? And look no further than the massive rally in some of these junk companies and junk securities here in the first couple of weeks of 2023. But that's investors, not companies, right? (laughs) True. But that's where I think it's really important is it all trickles down, right? I I don't care who it is. Uh, You know, the more executives from the the C-suite down to some 20 or 30 year old who's exposed to the stock price, even if it's in a very low dollar price kind of way, they all care. Like I am stunned at the amount of people who've been watching their stock price tick up and tick down every day, like a degenerate day trader in the past couple of years. So it really does matter. And if, you know, some of these junk companies that got smoked last year, they're up a hundred percent, 200 percent year to date off of a very low base, obviously, but it really does matter. And again, I don't think it can last. I don't think it will last, but it's, you know, I, I a lot think. of that, I think, I mean, this is just conjecture here, but I think retail has been flushed out. I think a lot of that is just short covering. Like people it wrote a lot oh, of these sure. down and there's just not that much liquidity to buy into. But hey, you know, you do your victory lap, take your chips off to move to uh, the next battle. For sure. And that's a huge part of it. And look, there's some companies that are absolutely on death's doorstep where the bonds are trading, you know, at 40 cents on the dollar and the stock's gone from four dollars to nine dollars this we year. We all know which year. company you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to be nicer. You know, <laughs> this, this guy. But it's like, you know, I guarantee you there are people inside that company who are just not equipped to think as an investor and either don't know where those bonds are trading, don't know what the state of the company's liquidity is, but they see the stock doubling in a matter of days and they think, wow, this must mean we have some hope. Like this must mean that there's good things right around the corner. And it's like that that's probably influencing their life and their decision making process a little bit, even inside the company. And it's just kind of a false hope, if you ask me. But anyway, my whole point of this was that I don't think I would, yeah, I just don't, I never say never, basically, I guess, even though in this case, it does seem like you're right. And it's time to put a nail in that coffin for, for the time being until the next speculative boom comes around. But I want to circle back real quick before I get too far off the rails on this and and just talk about something I heard the other day. It it was actually a book and I don't even remember the name of the book or the author and I'm not trying to uh, disparage it too much because it brings up an interesting argument and it was something from last year. This wasn't all that recent, but it's basically criticizing and you hear this argument a lot. So I'm curious for both of you to give a response to this, but um, it it just is this kind of criticism that we've heard over and over again, that the traditional metrics, quote unquote, don't make sense anymore, don't work, don't know how to value the new economy companies, don't know how to handle tech, all this kind of stuff, which we hear over and over again. And when asked for a prescription of what this person would do to fix the flaws in the accounting regime, he said that you know it's total nonsense that you can build a plant a physical plant, a factory, and put on your balance sheet, capitalize it, and then amortize it down over its useful life. But you can't do the same for R&D. Except he said like there should be just no expensing whatsoever. They, the R&D should just be like, I think, 100% capitalized, which was stunning that like you can capitalize an asset and not amortize it over some sort of useful life because <laughs> no R&D leads to like a perpetual asset as far as I've ever been made aware. Everything you know, unless capitalism is completely broken down and nothing matters anymore, like that that asset will decay, in fact, over some period of time. And then the numerical example he gave was, you know, nonsense, because if you amortize at least some of it, and I would argue that that's reasonable in a lot of cases, and that there is a case to be made that you should be able to capitalize some portion of your R&D spending, but it would certainly have to be amortized over, I don't know, 5, 10, maybe 15 years at the very most. I mean, how could you argue that it would have a calculable life of 25 years or 35 years, like an airplane or a building or something that's much more readily observed and 
and, and easily calculated. So that that was objection number one for me. And two was that he also argued that SG&A uh, should not be subject to full expensing or even any expensing because if you're Amazon and making all these investments, and I think Amazon was the actual example he used, of course, if you're Amazon and making all these investments in sales and marketing to reinvest in your customer relationship because you think the customer is going to stick around forever, like that's not, you know, that shouldn't be expensed in year one because the customer is going to stick around forever kind of thing. And my response to that is basically like nonsense because you don't know how long the customer is going to stick around. We all know my favorite whipping boy Peloton tried to tell me that their customers were going to stick around 13 years and it was more like 13 months. So if they had been capitalizing that on the balance sheet, like they would have a the mother of all write-offs that would have to happen here before too long. And my second response to that would be that, you know, sales and marketing and SG&A expenses have always applied to customers that were hopefully going to have a longer value to the company, a longer lifetime value than just the year in which they're expensed. Like there's nothing that's changed in terms of like the tech salesperson who's out there pitching snowflakes services to, you know, the shower ring salesman in planes, trains, and automobiles 45 years ago doing the same thing, like running around. Like they want repeat customers. Every business has always wanted repeat customers and they're hoping to sign people up and have them stick around for a long time. So I just don't see at all how that has changed. And the other thing that I find it's really bizarre is that nobody can ever explain to me beyond this like hand-waving kind of response about unit economics, about how this is all supposed to translate to the big picture. Because when pressed, they all seem to agree that the only way you can ever put any sort of financial value on an asset is to discount its future present or its future cash flows to the present. And so, look, I'm not here to say we need some sort of strict adherence to a literal DCF calculation in a spreadsheet, but if you don't agree with the framework and you want to talk about some sort of other hypothetical, you know, crypto style valuation of something like that's fine. We can have that debate separately, but if we all agree that the, the, the current value of any sort of asset has to be the discount of value of future cash flows, then what does this all matter? Like, you know, the argument again in this same context was like Ben Graham came up with securities analysis a hundred years ago because he was super risk averse coming out of the Great Depression and he wanted hard tangible assets. And yes, of course that's true. And no one's saying that you should rely on <laughs> price to book value or networking capital or any, you know, the liquidation value of physical assets is the end all be all. And Ben Graham himself kind of swore off of low price to book, even low price to earnings by the 1970s, like, you know, 50 years ago. So like, why are we still talking about this? And again, what gets completely nuts for me is coming off of this, you know, same sort of era. And then I'll get off my soapbox about this is like, we we didn't seem to learn the lesson that like a dollar of sales doesn't have any value to the owner of the company. A dollar of sales is totally meaningless unless it leaves some sort of residual that can be claimed by the owner of the asset. And in most of these cases, there was nothing left over for the owner of the asset. So therefore, the dollar of present value sales revenue doesn't matter. It doesn't make anything. It has to be it has to be a sign of something better to come in the future. And in some cases that tr- is true. And in most cases it's not. And you have to make some sort of judgment about where you end our, where you end up on that spectrum. So I'll stop there and, and let you guys chime in. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. First off, uh, hey, Goodwill stays at 100 uh, on the balance sheet forever until you write it down based on your faulty assumptions. But well, that's uh, a, Yeah, that's a different argument. I agree. There's uh, lots to other than that, there too. Yeah. That, that probably should, uh, you, you know... Least have to, you at least have to test it every year, right? In theory. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, look, if if you want to tell me like we're going to capitalize all R&D forever and then test it... Hey, I was just being facetious there. <laughs> no, but it's it, even... I, I'm not being facetious because it's a great point. And, but again, like these, these critics that seem to say like, oh, gap's so useless and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, then look, why don't you just go ahead and capitalize R&D and just come up with your own set of financial statements? Like it wouldn't hey, be that hard. you're stealing my punchline at the end of oh, this. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. I, I, I like when we go back and forth like that. Um you know, I, I mean, I think we always say this, but anything taken to the extreme is just wrong. Like you could have a good point and For take sure. it to the extreme and then you kind of leave what's sensible because, you know, hey, it is logical as an analyst to say, actually, some of this is investment and I'm going to capitalize it and see what the real underlying core earnings power of the business is. Um, but the problem is, you know, with physical stuff, you know how long a building lasts. 
you know how long a computer lasts on average. It's very easy to lie about how long something intangible lasts. And that intangible could be a customer file or it could be, uh, you know, figuring out how to categorize the entire internet. Yep, Google, I'm talking about you there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's just impossible to know how long that stuff really lasts and what a reasonable uh, schedule would look like. So, you know, I used to kind of think that maybe you should be allowed to capitalize R and D like they do in Europe and some other countries. Uh, I know Europe's a geography, not a country. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me for a second here. Um, but I actually think you should not. And I actually think it should all be expensed upfront. And I actually think companies that choose to capitalize it when they could expense it, that's just bad because if you expense it up front, you're lowering your tax burden and you increase NPV. So that's not a good signal either. Why would you rather show very high profits now when you have the choice to not and increase NPV? Again, that should be your goal, increase NPV. So as an analyst, feel free to capitalize. Feel free to make whatever assumptions you want. Feel free to like analyze what the core profitability of the business is, but let reality and execution show whether it creates value or not, because you'll know at some point in the future. Um, you don't need to do anything too fancy. And anytime companies have some degree of discretion, there are going to be some good actors, but I'd bet that you get more bad than good actors when they're given the discretion to do so. Yeah, no, and, and look, you raise a great point about the practical implications of it because if the cash is going to be there eventually, and again, if we don't agree that the cash ultimately matters, then we need to just step aside and have a different argument, which I always wonder with some of these people that argue this stuff in the extreme, like you were saying, Elliot, like it it kind of boggles my mind. But if if the economics and the cash are going to be there eventually, and you're upset because the company's being too conservative, essentially, by fully expensing everything today. I don't know what to tell you. Like, that's completely insane, right? Because not only is there a tax benefit to expensing it today, but like, that just means that like, you've got a fully depreciated asset that you never capitalized that's generating all this beautiful economics for you in the future. So you should be happy with that, right? And, and you can make your own adjustments along the way. So I truly don't, I don't get it. I've, I've never quite understood it, but here we are. Yeah, and if you're a company and want to illustrate that you have good unit economics, it doesn't have to be done through the accounting code. There are different ways you could oh, go God, about for sure. Yeah, showing people, you know, to what degree you're investing. Uh, you know, there are some companies that'll give you like this is our uh, maintenance capex and this is our growth capex. Why can't you do that with your opex? It's really not that freaking hard. Well, didn't we um, talk about this once? Because like it's stunning to me. When I ask a CEO or a CFO, you know, what's your maintenance capex? What's your growth capex? How many of them are like completely honest in saying that we we don't know? Like we we don't don't have a number for that. That's like a staggering admission of guilt, basically, right? But I because I'm with do you, you think right? That's like, done out of ignorance, or do you think no, that's done by choice? No, because look, I think there are plenty of CEOs who would just say like, well, yeah, like we have a good idea of what that number is and we're not going to tell you, which is fine. They're not required to. Um, and I'm not asking for a specific number. I'm not asking for any forward guidance. I'm asking about like in the past, how much of what you've spent that is shown up in your publicly available financial filings, how much of it would you attribute to one thing over another and in round figures or ranges or whatever, and some of them say like, yeah, we know what that number is and we're just not going to share it publicly for whatever <laughs> reason, which is totally fine. And a good number of them are like very, very honest and just say like, yeah, we, we, we don't even really know. Like we don't know where to begin measuring that. We don't know where to begin, you know, even, even capturing that or thinking about that. Or like a, a stunning number of them have been like, oh, well, I've never actually really thought about it. It's like, oh boy, you know, it's just tough. Never thought about it would be a pretty big red flag. I've definitely yeah. seen oh, plenty of companies disclose times. it, though. Yeah, sure. Which is great when they do. Like more power to them, right? Yeah. So, I mean, a company who feels their R and D should be capitalized should be pretty discreet about what portion of R and D is maintenance versus what portion is uh, growth. But I've yet to see that kind of company out there yet. 
And again, I mean, to go back to the Netflix example, right? They've been really, really good over the years in helping investors understand what's going on. And there's been obviously a huge difference in reported earnings versus reported cash flow, largely due to the assets they have on the books and the amortization of intangibles and production costs. And yeah, you know, I've gone down the rabbit hole a little bit and like it's a pretty nerdy but fascinating accounting issue. And I have no doubt whatsoever that Am- that Netflix handled it exceptionally well. And it still created like at least a little bit of uncertainty and confusion and controversy in certain investor circles. And I don't think it matters at all. And I think we're seeing that play out now, right? As as the company's maturing and changing and hitting different points in the life cycle, I think it's being completely validated. And so if you do it the right way, like there's nothing stopping you. Like this isn't sort of any sort of limiting factor. You just have to be transparent. You have to be forthright. You have to be correct, of course, right? I mean, that's that's problem number one with, with some of these arguments, yes. some of these situations. So, Yeah, I've always appreciated Netflix for how candid they are with things. I remember when uh, Whitney Tilson wrote a short report on them. The way Reed Hastings handled it is so different yeah, 100%. than how you've seen some of these other CEOs handle I've literally public used short it. I've used it as an example where I've talked to CEOs when they've asked me because this has thankfully not been an issue for years, but at my old firm, uh, it was a long short fund and we actually had a short only fund for a while. And I was, I guess, well, uh, one of the analysts and and portfolio managers and, and then partner that came up. And so for a while, like I never could figure out why I'd get this kind of jaundiced eye from companies when I'd first meet them. And I finally had an investor relations person tell me once that in one of their databases, it wasn't I can't remember what database it was, but they said, oh, you were flagged as like a big short seller. <laughs> <laughs> to even keep such a database as a red yeah. flag. Well, yeah, it was kind of odd. Like I, I I don't know how they, again, but I, you know, once they realized that that was or wasn't the case, like the entire dialogue changed. But anyway, I used to use Reed Hastings' response to that as like the perfect example of how a CEO should respond. And I always said that back when I was a short seller and looking for short ideas, when a company responded with like a bunch of scorched earth ad hominem attacks to a a short seller, it was a bad sign. Like, you know, nine times out of 10, it meant that the short seller was absolutely onto something and where there was smoke, there actually was fire. And so, and of course, you know, as with almost everything else in, in business and investing, Buffett himself said like, he has absolutely no problem with somebody shorting Berkshire because it's a guaranteed buyer of the stock eventually down the road. It doesn't change anything having to do with the business. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So if you want to short Berkshire stock, like more power to you. And that is 100% the attitude that every CEO should have so long as the business is being run, being run as they say it is. So Exactly right. Well, you guys said it so well. Um, really don't have much to add there maybe just uh, a final word as we finish up here um going back to the chart that Elliot introduced at the very beginning i think um you know tying it back to kind of timeless wisdom by ben graham i think it really speaks to the concept of voting machine versus weighing machine because you know, you can have a period of time where valuations get completely out of whack and people don't care if companies are money losing or not and so forth. And we've we've had that fairly recently. But as you go out several years and as time passes, the weighing machine kicks in. And unless you have become profitable, um, you're just not going to be able to sustain uh, those kinds of valuations because ultimately a business exists in order to generate cash for its shareholders and that's where the whole dcf concept comes in and so i think just keeping that in mind you know if you're investing in a money losing business you know you have to have confidence that that's going to turn around and you know looking at that chart where basically the um companies that make money and the companies that were losing money started out in the same spot and then five years later they the ones that were still making money and the ones that initially were not making money but then ended up making money basically um ended up in this in the same spot as well um and so to me it's easier 
for a company that is that is making money to keep making money or it's easier to identify those kinds of companies than to identify companies that are losing money but will make money in the future and so i think you know there's nothing wrong for investors to just stick with companies that are making money today and to have a good uh, thesis for why they're undervalued i think you'll you'll do just fine now, obviously you know probably the the huge winners are going to come from a turnaround in profitability but i don't think you have to go out and and look for those kinds of companies in order to be successful no i don't either like i i think you can find plenty of companies today that are trading at reasonable levels. I don't think the whole market's any sort of generational buying opportunity by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some individual companies that I'm capable of evaluating that I think are at prices that are going to allow some really decent, attractive returns for the next several years. And if you can find those, and in a lot of cases, they have good balance sheets. Again, I'm speaking out of my own personal experience here, but they're definitely out there. But I, Elliot's, I think, original premise, which I totally agree with, is it... it it's a double-edged sword because there are some of these companies that are not going to be able to turn that corner from profitability, from unprofitability to profitability. But the ones that can make that turn are probably being tossed out with the bathwater right now. So you have to be able to be really sure that you're correct. You have to be really sure that you can withstand the pain and the company can withstand the pain. But if you can go out and find that Netflix style company that is going to be able to make the right cuts, make the right pivot, and and push forward to a bigger, better, brighter future, the rewards are going to be off the charts. And if nothing else, um, I agree with everything both of you guys have said the last uh, minute or two, or two. But if nothing else, I'd also say, you know, you look at a company like Priceline, they made their turnaround. You didn't have to be there when things first turned, but sure. it would have been helpful to have studied them and looked for the signs of the turn and start yeah. following them once they deliver profitability and be like, oh, wow, these these guys really are legit. Because you could have bought them like two years after they became profitable and had one of the best IRRs over the next decade of any stock in the universe. Um, so I do think these are the kind of companies you want to spend some time learning about because, hey, maybe you will identify one or two of the ones that can turn. And if not, maybe you'll be in position to say, oh, I did the work on this company and I do know it. They're profitable now. I'm ready to play ball. Yeah. And to your point, that's a fantastic point and really important because I've made this mistake several times, which is I do the work. I start to identify like what I'm looking for. I start to look for just the specific milestones that I need to see to make sure the thesis is playing out. But then because the stock price or the security price in general has moved up, it's gotten more expensive. I think like, boy, I've missed it. It's too late. You know, the the train left the station and I wasn't on it. And that's often, if you're right about one of these things, I mean, just go back and look at the number of times you could have bought Priceline or anybody else like that, that had turned the corner, that was executing, that was doing everything you'd want to see. And yeah, great. Like, okay, the stock's up 20% or 50% from where it hit an absolute low. You were never going to be able to time that perfectly anyway. So don't talk yourself out of it. If the numbers still make sense and if the thesis is still intact, like you have to pull the trigger and, and be willing to have the courage to do it. Well, on that note, guys, thank you so much. Fascinating discussion. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.